Good morning to everybody. Uh, buenos dias. And uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. And I'm glad everybody was able to, to join us this morning. Uh, the dialogue is extremely uh, pleased uh, to um, partner in this program today with Alianzas, Alianza Americas, uh, directed by our good friend uh, Oscar Chacon, who's with us, who is an esteemed member of the Inter-American Dialogue. And we're very, very happy to work together with uh, Alianza. On February 3rd, uh, Salvadorans will go to the polls to elect a new president. And if no candidate gets an absolute majority on, on that date, um, there will be a second round that's scheduled now for March 10th. The election comes at a crucial moment, and the economy is struggling, just over 2% uh, growth since 2014. Nearly 40% of Salvadorans uh, live in poverty today. The levels of crime and violence, especially by gangs, have been very high. And corruption, including uh, involving three former presidents uh, from the Arena Party and also from the FMLN, has been widespread. All of this, according to the polls, have led to broad disaffection and disenchantment with the political system. Uh, certainly, El Salvador is not unique in this respect. Yesterday, we had a very interesting event on the upcoming elections in Brazil. And one could have said uh, the same sentence about how Brazilians feel about their political system and their political parties. Since the peace accords ending the country's civil war were signed in 1992, two parties have dominated Salvadoran politics. For two decades, the conservative Arena Party, and for the last decade, the FMLN of the left, the former guerrilla group. The current Gallup poll shows that the front runner currently for the election is Naib Bukele, the former mayor of El Salvador from the Ghana party. And it's the first time in three decades that an outsider has a good chance or has a real chance at winning the presidency. This morning, we will hear from Carlos Calleja, the candidate of the Arena party, and second uh, currently in the polls, at least in the Gallup poll. Mr. Calleja is a business leader, a social entrepreneur, an heir of the country's largest supermarket brand, Super Selectos. He's never held public office before and is a relative newcomer to the Arena Party, joining the party in 2013. In the internal primaries of the party last April, he won uh, the nomination uh, easily with over 60% of the vote. He's a graduate of Middlebury College of Vermont and also of the uh, NYU Stern School of Business uh, in, in New York. There's a lot of interest uh, in this election uh, and Salvador's future in the United States and especially here in Washington, D.C. Salvadoran population in the U.S. is very significant and this area has one of the com largest communities of Salvadorans um, in the country how to deal with the migration issue, including temporary protective status, is a fundamental question. Also, remittances make up a substantial share of El Salvador's uh, foreign exchange. And there's been considerable cooperation between the United States and Salvador in the last three years uh, in the context of the Alliance for Prosperity. Um, the outgoing governments uh, decision to recognize recently uh, the People's Republic of China has also provoked uh, some reaction here in Washington. Mr. Calleja has agreed to share some opening remarks about his ideas for addressing these challenges and why he's running for the presidency of El Salvador and uh, what he would what he would do should he be elected on uh, February 3rd or if the second round on March 10th. After that, we'll move to a conversation and then open it up to discussion um, with all of you. So again, thank you all for being here. And uh, Mr. Calleja, thank you very much. And welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing this morning? Good? 
I actually have nothing prepared. I came with, with the mindset that it would be better to be able to share amongst all of us um, in a more informal environment and hopefully take away from this dialogue um, important insumos, inputs, for the work that lays ahead uh, in terms of our political project. Um, we're wrapping up uh, a three-day trip today to the United States, which has been incredibly successful. And um, I think there's no better place to wrap it up than here. Everyone here is here for a purpose. Uh, we share a common interest, whether it be Latin America or in, in many of our cases, El Salvador, a common love. And I guess that takes me to my first point that I wanted to make, which is why, why someone like me, who was very, very happy in the private sector, selling fruits and vegetables to the Salvadorian community in, in our supermarket company, um, decides to take a leap into Salvadorian politics, which is, if I can say so, no walk in the park, without a doubt. Um, well, I think politics in general, there's elections coming up in the United States, it's, it's no walk in the park anywhere anymore. Um, I took the decision over a year and a half ago. Um, it was a decision that I had been thinking about for a long time. I had had a really happy, um, successful career, one might say, in the private sector, uh, where I felt, como decimos en El Salvador, completely realized, satisfied. But there was something in me, a calling, if you want to say, uh, that made me want to do something more. I'd worked uh, through the company with many small farmers. Um, our business allows us to visit all 14 departments of the country. and I had a real connection with a lot of the population. I also had the opportunity to start the Calleja Foundation, which was focused in education. And that opened my eyes up to a lot of the suffering, a lot of the needs that our people in El Salvador are going through. I think it was through that exercise that I decided I couldn't just stand there with my arms crossed and watch everything go in the direction it was going. And we had a conversation with my wife. We have two kids, Santiago and Miranda. I don't know how many, how many parents are here. Let's see, show of hands. How many are parents? Almost everyone. So you guys understand what it means to be a parent and, and what it means to be working for, for something above and beyond yourself. And with Andrea, we, we made a decision that we wanted to live our lives in El Salvador. We wanted our kids to be able to grow up in a country of equal opportunity, which unfortunately, the country that we love so much right now is not. So I decided to look for the candidacy to the presidency. Um, and in El Salvador, there's, there's two major parties, as Michael said. And I want to thank you, Michael, for this invitation. I want to thank the dialogue um, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, there's two major parties, El FMLN, who's currently in power, and ARENA. And someone like me, who didn't have a political past, per se, or a trajectory in politics, to reach the presidency, uh, most probably needed to uh, align themselves and work together with one of these major parties. And I found in ARENA a good partner, a partner with which I could identify their principles, their values, they're actually universal principles and values that, that I share, such as liberty, democracy, the human individual as the center of society, our faith in God as well as something that we share in that party. So it was an easy decision for me in terms of which party to choose. I was also really attracted by the fact that ARENA had opened up its party to internal democracy. Today, I don't know where Mauricio is, but he joined me. Where's Mauricio Interiano, the president of the party? Mauricio is the president of ARENA. He's the first democratically elected president of ARENA. So with that precedent, I felt more comfortable, and they had said that they were going to do a primary, the first real primary in the history of our country. And then I decided to participate. And like Michael said, 
Um, I left my ego, mi orgullo, everything aside and took the plunge. Nothing to lose. And it was a great experience. I got my master's at NYU and I got my doctorate during that primary. It was really an incredible experience. Um, and we won due to a great team. We won in all 14 departments of El Salvador with over 63% of the vote. Um, and it was, it was a special experience. After that, we had to make some decisions. And one of the decisions we made was to look to form an alliance. And we did. So after a lot of work with small parties, PCN, PDC, some of you may know them, Democracia Salvadoreña, we built a coalition. We signed an accord. And that goes in alignment with my view for what we need to be doing in the country, which is our first objective, which is unite the country around common values, a shared vision, those of us who believe in democracy and liberty, in a land of equal opportunity, in a private sector which can help us be the motor for growth and economic and social development. And we were able to get that done and we signed less than two months ago, La Alianza por un Nuevo País. So now I'm the candidate for Arena and three other parties. The only candidate on the ticket who has four flags. I'm competing against two other candidates, one for the FMLN, who's the party in power, and the other Ghana's candidate. And um, like Michael said, there are some polls out there, but we're incredibly optimistic, very, very optimistic in terms of the election and what we can do. Our objectives are, I would say, audacious. We want to unite the country. We want to build bridges between Salvadorians who have been historically, I would say, enfrentados. And uh, we think we can do it. Uh, I'm a big believer that if we get political will and a political maturity around the major issues that we're facing, whether it be economic issues, whether it be security issues, whether it be health, education, um, we can get things done. I'm a big believer that our biggest barrier in the past has been our inability since the peace accords, which were an example for an entire hemisphere, if not for, for the world, um, we haven't really been able to move forward at the rate that our country deserves. So I look to build a new political project with ARENA, with this alliance, and with civil society who believes in a new era of accords. That's our first objective in this political project. Our second objective in terms of the vision, is to form the best government in the history of our country. Un gobierno con amplia participación ciudadana, as we say. An inclusive government which takes into account civil society. A government based on surrounding the presidency with the best leaders the country has to offer. Una verdadera meritocracia. I believe in that, and we've been working in that. Actually, my VP pick came out of a methodology based on those principles. A brilliant young woman, 42 years old, graduate from Harvard's Kennedy School, graduate also with a master's from La Universidad de Chile, Pontífice, in economics, and a graduate from El Esen in El Salvador, um, and she did this all on scholarship. A self-made woman, a fighter, a strong woman, even though that probably wasn't the easiest decision within the context of the politics in El Salvador where most of the political parties wanted to see a congressman or a mayor as the running mate. So that was the first step we took. It's the first decision that I had to make along with building an alliance that goes above and beyond Arena and includes civil society to offer our nation a different option, a new option. And our third objective after forming this government is to build a new country. I know that sounds audacious, but I really believe we can do it. 
And when I close my eyes and I think about that country, I tend to see a pyramid. I call it the pyramid of hope, the triangle of hope, if you will. And at the top, in the cornerstone, I see a robust, audacious economy that focuses its initiatives on generating different types of jobs to what we've historically seen in El Salvador. I'm a firm believer that we can no longer present El Salvador to the world and to the global economy simply as a low-wage human resource provider. We have to take steps to build an economy focused on value added, on innovation, on technology. And if I were going to find three buckets in terms of private investment, the type of investment we want to bring to El Salvador, it's that type of investment. And as president, I personally plan to travel the world, travel to the United States to talk to the best countries, to the best companies, and their CEOs, and make an argument as to why they should invest in El Salvador. And I think this is key. It's key for you guys to understand that we no longer want to go and look to the past as a model for development, but understand that the global economy is changing. It's looking for human capital that's well prepared, that's educated, and it's looking for products and services that are differentiated, competitive, and that entail a value added equation. And that goes in technology, it goes in tourism, it goes in agriculture, which is something I'm passionate about since I started working with small farmers. My experience with small farmers, like I said, really opened up to my, my eyes to the opportunities that we have in El Salvador. Because when I've traveled, and I've traveled through this country for the last year and a half, a pesar de que estamos pasando por tiempos muy difíciles, our people have not lost hope. It really is incredible to see how the Salvadorian community continues to fight against all odds and strive to get ahead. I was with small farmers last week. 75-year-old man broke into tears telling me about how his grandson and his son had given up on agriculture. His grandson is in jail because he couldn't find opportunities and decided to join a gang and ended up on the streets. And this story is common, but he hasn't lost faith. And that's what drives us to move in this direction. Now, to build this audacious economy, we can't just think about jobs. I think it would be, it would be small-minded to just think about economic issues. And that's why we're betting on education. One of our biggest bets in terms of our vision, in terms of our proposal, is major education reform. And here in the United States, something that's commonly spoken about is early stage education. It's not something that has permeated much in Central America, but it's something that my wife, that our team, that myself really believe in. And we're studying successful models around the world to see how we can implement that in El Salvador. Because the story speaks for itself. The development curve is completely different and much greater when countries invest in early stage education. At the same time, we want to extend education. Our dropout rates are horrendous. After ninth grade, you get enormous dropout rates. So we're looking to models that have been successful in terms of financing through becas or school loans so that all Salvadorians in the public system can get a good education and graduate from high school. And those who want to continue with a technical career or university should have access to that too. Because it's a waste of time to think about building an audacious, new, innovative economy if we don't invest in human resources. And in El Salvador, for all, for all of you who know our country, know that human resource is our best resource. It's our most voluminous resource and it's our most valuable resource. So our bet is on our people. And it's our people empowered 
with opportunity that will lift this country up. But they need a government that creates a climate that favors investment, that offers strong social programs in education and health, and guarantees security for their families and able to get the job done. I come from the private sector. I'm used, I'm used to working on a results-based model. And that's something I'm committed to from the get-go. Our government is not going to be tied up by analysis paralysis, but based on clear objectives, surrounding myself with the right executives, with the right experience in the public sector and maybe the private sector to get the job done. That's my business, getting the job done business. I believe in dialogue. I believe in uniting a country, but I also believe that our people are desperate and they need to see results now. We've waited long enough. But I also firmly believe that El Salvador is in a position to take off. If you look at the geopolitical situation in the region, and I don't want to talk specifically about other countries because it can be judgmental and I don't want to do that in this dialogue, but it's self-evident and you guys who study the region know the issues that our neighboring countries are going through. And if we make the right decisions and we ignite the right fuses, we really can take off as a country. And we can position El Salvador as a leader in the region. And the trip that we've done to the United States had three major objectives and the feedback that we've gotten in all three reconfirms that thesis that El Salvador is positioned to really take off. Now Michael spoke about certain situations that are happening geopolitically in the region and we've spoken about those issues with our meetings at the Department of State, members of the White House. We've been with Congress over the last few days. We've been with the Salvadorian community, both here and in New York. And they see in our project hope. Because we came here not only to listen, but to commit ourselves, to comprometernos with making a difference. I don't know, Michael, if you want me to talk here about what we're seeing with regards to China. I don't know if you want me to talk here about uh, TPS, or would you rather we talk about it sitting down? Well, let me just say that it's an honor to be here. And one last message. The best way we can attract investment to El Salvador, the best way we can attract aid to El Salvador, the best way we can honor Salvadorians in the United States for the help that they send us every month is to take responsibility for our own actions within El Salvador. To give our people in El Salvador an opportunity to grow and to realize the Salvadorian dream within our borders. We have to take ownership of our country and not look to a dependency relationship with other countries, other communities to get ahead. And that's something that I've realized over the last year and a half. And that's probably the most important message, and it's the most well-received message that we've been able to give in this trip to the United States. From the State Department to the White House, to Congress, to the Salvadorians here. They want to see us take ownership for our own issues. And that's the most attractive way to act in order to attract help, foreign direct investment, remittances, whatever it may be. It's a new time for El Salvador, and we need to do this. I'm convinced. And only in that way will our country really take off. But it's an honor to be here, and I'm psyched to share a few minutes or a, a good hour with, with you guys this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, uh, for your remarks and and for laying out your your vision and your your hopes for for El Salvador, which uh, I think uh, many people, if not all people, in this room share. I think they do. Um, 
So uh, let, let me, we'll get to, um, to TPS and I'll get to China maybe in a second if that's okay. But not, let me, if I could, start with a, um, a question, which is that, you know, um, you won the primary in your party by, like you said, 63%, 63% of the vote, but roughly. that roughly, so that means that 30% voted for another candidate. The first question is a two-part question. One is how sort of confident are you that the ARENA party itself um, is united behind you? But before talking about uniting the whole country, just within your party, how is that? And the second related to this is that um, just from everything that one reads, at least that I read, this looks like a chain, a change election, um, that Salvadorans are hungry for change. Um, and that means a kind of uh, a perception that's out there, it seems to me, that many Salvadorans see both of the main political parties as, as discredited, as not having delivered. Arena, when it had its opportunity, and now the recent corruption cases against the, against uh, Antonio Saca and, and, uh, and Flores. Um, how, how do you present yourself as an agent of change when uh, Salvador and the FMLN also discredited uh, after 10 years and, and also corruption of former president of uh, Funes. How do, you, how do you kind of consolidate your party but yet present it as sort of a new option that's different from what Salvadorans have seen over the last 30 years from the platform of the Arena Party? Uh, I think both great questions. The first question, I'm convinced that party unity has been consolidated. Um, I'm receiving reports constantly. I'm in the territory constantly. I am the type of candidate who likes to be out in the territory. We, that's a term we use in El Salvador, territorio, uh, visiting all 14 departments, visiting all the municipalities, working with uh, the party organization. And now it's not just ARENA. It's four different parties that we're working with and really um, really we're beginning to feel uh, a growing enthusiasm. Not only are we united, I think there's a new sense of urgency that um, we're getting a sense of across the country. And what is also super attractive to me is that civil society is getting involved. And I think it's the right time. The election's in February. We're coming into October. And it just makes sense that people, we all tend to procrastinate, now in October are realizing the importance of participating. So our call is not only to Unite Arena, but it's to find a operational functionality that allows us to work together as four parties to cover as much ground as possible. Between all four parties, we govern 75% of the population, roughly, in terms of municipalities, in terms of mayors. Um, and get that machinery, which is incredibly powerful, to start working like a Swiss watch, mm -hmm. which we're seeing. The party has never been so well prepared for an election in terms of working its territory strategy, getting people ready for the vote, as it is now. We've advanced close to 95% of our objective, which was for late October. We've got it done now in September. Um, your second question is the million dollar question, without a doubt. And I think that we're doing a relatively good job. ARENA y FMLN are the status quo for many, as you say. And it would be really easy for me to play the Donald Trump card and just take the ARENA nomination, but attack ARENA and attack El FMLN. It was a strategic decision that I had to make at a certain point in time. But I also had to be genuine to myself. And I don't know how many people have run for president here yet. But if you do, my best advice to you is be authentic. Is be real. And for me to be that populist who just decides to go anti-system, anti-politica, anti Democracia representativa, anti-political parties, didn't feel right. 
I had advisors tell me, go down that route. I said, I can't do it. I'd rather stay genuine to who I am. Now I have the advantage that Arena is in the middle of a renovation. Starting with the president of the party, first elected president of the party, democratically so. I am the first democratically elected candidate in the history of my country. That shows us that a pesar que las cosas están difíciles, la democracia está desarrollándose. And we have to be on the right side of history, on the right side of causes. So Arena has to continue to open up the selection of the vice presidency. An educator, a professor, someone from civil society was against the current, against the political current, against even some people's criteria within Arena and other political parties. But we got that through. With this, I want to say that Arena has showed me their openness and embraced this new vision that we have. And of all the candidates, or of the three candidates which you mentioned, FMLN, Ghana, and the Alliance's candidate, which is myself, the only candidate who hasn't touched one cent of public funds, who hasn't been signaled for corruption, is my person. And I think that makes us, once, you, once you're able to communicate that, which is obviously the major objective in a campaign, the best option for this country at this time. Aside from the fact that the number one issue in our country, when you speak to people about their personal situation, not the collective mind. The collective mind is the number one issue is Security, obviously, because of the cancer that we live with the crime and the gang violence. That's the collective issue. But the individual issue, the issue that drives a vote, that drives an election, that drives a mindset is economic. It's all about jobs. How do they say it in, in the Clinton campaign? It's about the economy, stupid. That's relevant right now in El Salvador, you know? I actually spoke about this with people from the Clinton campaign in that era. And in that sense, I also feel I am the most prepared and experienced candidate to understand what the economy needs. I come from the private sector. I've decided to make a leap into the public sector, but I bring with me that experience. I bring with me an experience that's made me understand that great things are done in teams, not individually. That you can't promise a country that you're a messiah and that you can change everything just because you're enlightened. You have to surround yourself by the best people. And I think that's a competitive advantage as well that we have. And in this alliance, I don't know if you knew this, Michael, we have ex-guerrilla warriors, fighters, ex-military people from the right. It spans from the right to the center left. What we share is our belief in democracy, in liberty, the same principles that the dialogue hold dear. So I think we have to communicate well that the only real outsider who has a chance to win is myself. The other candidates, one has probably two decades of political experience, and the other one has been running for president for nine years, has run through two municipalities, levered them up to the hill, and showed with a track record what type of administration he's used to running. If I could just pick up on, on that. As, as the outsider in this race, because everybody, the titles of all the articles say the outsider is uh, is uh, Bukele, but um, and it's it's ironic that they say that because he's held you know public office in exactly. heaven, but he's the outsider. But anyway, um, are you? How do you view these corruption cases that have taken place, including former 
presidents from your party, former president of the FMLN, is that, is that, in your view, a kind of a positive development that there is, you know, rule of law, that there's some accountability for this? And you believe the role of the attorney general is to pursue those cases vigorously? I mean, wh where do you stand on what's, what's been happening in this terms of these, these corruption investigations? I think it's a fantastic, fantastic evolution that we're seeing in terms of the rule of law. I personally celebrate and congratulate the Attorney General's, I would call, valentia, uh, courage, to do what he is doing, because it's not easy in a country like El Salvador to do what he's doing. And I really applaud what he's been able to do. I mean, we have a, an ex-president in jail, convicted. That's a great thing for our country. It's not a great thing for him, obviously, but it's a great thing for our country. And I applaud that. And it's something that comes into play, electorally speaking, because there's going to be an election for an attorney general in November. And I can go on the record here. We either need him or we need someone like him. And I'm happy to support him. Now, that doesn't mean I can speak for the entire alliance, which controls 49 out of 84 seats in the legislative which I lead, but I can commit to making strong arguments why it either has to be him or someone who has the same guts and conviction to fight corruption like this man has. Think about it, 300 million bucks. Funes, $350 million, $650 million. He not only ripped off The Salvadorian people, he ripped out people's dreams and hopes for a better life. How many social programs could we have done? I mean, we have issues in El Salvador. Systemic structural issues in education, in health, in security. How many schools? How many medications? People aren't getting medications in El Salvador. People are dying, waiting in line for a surgery. It's absurd. We need to combat crime. We need to combat corruption. One of the things we did two weeks ago is as an alliance, we put on the table in La Asamblea five initiatives, new laws, reforms, including one which eliminates La Partida Secreta, which to me is the root cause of the cancer of corruption because impunity, my friends, you all know this, impunity is a disease which foments corruption. Y la partida secreta is a black box where a president can do whatever the heck he wants with public funds. And that's the first thing we're doing. And I'm not waiting to be elected to do that. I have the power now as the leader of the coalition to push these things through. And we're doing that. So I celebrate the Fiscal's work. I thank the United States and its Justice Department for the aid. I thank Colombia and its Justice Department for the aid, not economic, but in terms of capacity building, training that they've given us in order to get these cases done and to get these convictions and mi llamado, my call, is that we continue in this direction. And as a president who wants to do things well, to be honest with you, it's the best hedge I got. It's the best way I know I can sleep tranquilo at night as president of the republic because I know that we have you know, a good attorney general with a great team making sure things are being done well. But I will commit today in front of you que mi mano no va a temblar. I will not hesitate to use all the force I have as President of the Republic to go after the criminals, the thieves who intend to steal the money of the Salvadorian people with all the power that I may have. When I talk to attorneys, to DAs, oftentimes they tell me their biggest adversary is not delinquency. It's a lack of funds, a lack of resources, a lack of help a lack of training from the central government.
The same with our police force. We're going to war almost every day. Their wives call me. Our police officer wives call me worried about their husbands. Police officer husbands call me worried about their wives because they feel that they're exposed, that they don't have the tools to fight crime in a country that's crime-ridden. My commitment with corruption, with crime, is to lead from the front, not from the back. And to support those institutions, el sistema y el órgano judicial, so that they can do their job. That said, let me be clear. I'm not going to come and offer mano dura cuatro, like Tony Saka offered mano dura tres. That's not the solution. I believe we have to invest much more in prevention. Much more. And that's why we have to work also in creating jobs, in creating opportunities, in education, in keeping kids in school. But we also have to decentralize the government and work with municipalities, with community leaders, with mayors, to penetrate nationally in all 262 depart the municipalities of our country and make a difference. Centralizing all power as these governments have in the past, in me, is a huge mistake. But it's great for corruption. It's great for getting all the money together in one big pool behind a black box that you can do whatever the heck you want to do with it. And that's going to change with us. And I don't even have to win for that to change. I'm going to win, God willing, but we're going to push that through hopefully before. So yes, I celebrate that. And my call is that we continue in that direction. And I am grateful for all those friends who have made a difference in that. Thank you. I'm going to ask this two, the two questions that you raised at the podium, and then we're going to open it up to all of you for questions and comments. And I know there are a lot of people that, that are very eager to ask you. They've been very patient. But if I can just refer, if you could just talk a little bit about the TPS issue, uh, what, you're, what you're communicating to Congress and other officials right. here, what do you expect, and also the, the China um, decision by uh, the current government and uh, how you regard that and what you would do if anything changed that should you be president. Immigration. That's a major issue. A major issue here in the United States, a major issue in the Northern Triangle and in Mexico, obviously. All the meetings we've had over the last couple of days, all the meetings that I have in the United States uh, with representatives of the, of, 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 of the United States, all the meetings I have in El Salvador, with the embassy, this issue comes up. And my commentary to all of you who care about this issue is we cannot throw in the towel. There is an opportunity to find a critical path which allows us to create a situation where many of these people with TPS can find a permanent status migratorio here in the United States. And we have to continue our advocacy, our work in this direction. I'm convinced that there is an opportunity to do so. I've spoke to the legislative, I spoke to senators, I've spoke to congressmen, and they've received well my comments. Because I asked them, point blank, keep fighting for this. And they said, keep fighting. They've also said to me a stronger relationship between El Salvador and the United States would help. If we could have a government in El Salvador that we can trust, that we can work with, there's potential to reach an agreement. And that goes back to what I said earlier. We need to take responsibility for our own country. That's what people want. It's as simple as that. They want to know that we're going to do the work that we need to do on our end. And if we do that, I think we can get an agreement with the legislative here in the United States. I think we get congressmen and senators to support us. Let's be realistic. It's not an easy task to deport 200,000 productive, many of them community, community leaders, Salvadorians who own small businesses, 
who are professionals, who are fathers and mothers of Americans, that's not an easy option for the United States. They know that. They've realized that. So we cannot throw in the towel. And yes, I do think there are solutions out there. And I am currently working on them. I can't say everything that I've talked about, obviously, because I'd have to tell you what congressmen and senators have said to me. But what I can say is that they're very receptive to this idea, knowing that I am willing to build a country with the Salvadorian people who creates opportunities so that the Salvadorians can realize their dream, the Salvadorian dream, in El Salvador, and not have to look to migrate to the United States. Because the best foreign policy the United States could have, the best investment the United States can make with regards to this issue is help us create opportunities, create jobs, create a future for our kids in El Salvador. So yes, that's in play, and it's something that I'm going to continue to work for as candidate and then as president. Um, the second issue, China, China, Taiwan. Yeah, I mean, China you know, has a lot of money. Um, they invested in countries. They create jobs. I mean, is, that, this, uh, is this a wise uh, change? Because this could, you know, if there's investment, there's more trade with El Salvador. This is a big, big market in, 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 in China. Salvador has a lot of exports. Uh, isn't this, wouldn't that decision be consistent with what the decision I think it's more complicated than that, Michael, to be honest with you. I think we need to study the sequence of a bound, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if anyone else in this room was, but I was taken by surprise with that decision. It was a curveball. I got information 24 hours before it came out. And the big question to me was the lack of transparency. What went down? What is going down? What's happening there? There still isn't transparency. And when we talk about foreign policy, when I talk about foreign policy, the first question is, how does this benefit El Salvador? How will it benefit all Salvadorians? What type of jobs are we going to be able to create? My issue is not with China, right? So I'm not here uh, in any way uh, señalando a China. What I am talking about is the way the decision was made and the lack of transparency in the decision. And the issues that have arisen since that. The proposal for a special economic zone in the legislative. And the legalese around that structure and whether that is something that benefits all Salvadorians, workers, investors, or is it a tailor-made suit for a specific investment for one country that benefits a specific part of the population or political party in El Salvador. If you go further and you start reading, you know, what some congressmen in, 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 in Taiwan are saying, your hairs can stand up, right? I don't want to speculate about that. But there are clear, clear indicators that we should get to the truth on this matter. And I think the truth is always our best ally. So before opining on whether a relationship with China, El Salvador, is something that can benefit, I think we should figure out what went down and understand that, especially within the context of a presidential election. Why now? And make sure that it's in the best interest of the Salvadoran people. My foreign policy as president, our government's foreign policy as an administration, we we'll look to create relationships based on shared values and principles, on transparency, and on protecting the sovereignty of our nation, including its territory. And I think that's something very important that should be analyzed within the context of this situation. What do we gain? What do we win? What does it entail territory-wise? This proposal that's in the legislative right now. Um, we're personally not too open to that proposal, to be honest with you, nor are we as an alliance right now. With that end, we've spoken about it, and uh, it's not something that we can actually look at seriously without understanding what's behind it.
Now, the special economic zones in general are something that I think could be attractive, especially if I'm willing to bet on innovation, technology, value-added services, new industries. I think there's something that could work. But what I'm not willing to vouch for or to support is a tailor-made suit for a hidden agenda focused on certain special interests. That's not something that I'm going to back. Um, you made me a question directly, China El Salvador. I don't know if indirectly you wanted to know if I'd be willing to go back on the decision made. That, I'd say, is not something that I can answer. Mm -hmm. That's speculative. Um, what I will say is that our foreign policy is going to be based on mutual respect, on transparency, and on the best interests of the Salvadorian people, and on the sovereignty of our nation. Is your, let me just a quick follow up and then, then we'll open it up. Is your perception that, that having talked to officials in the State Department, the White House, and Congress, is that this is a very significant concern across the board in the U.S. government in terms of relations with El Salvador in this decision? It's a very, very significant concern. And it, it is a worrisome issue for me because you're talking about, I would say, roughly 3 million Salvadorians in the United States, more than we have in the greater San Salvador area. I mean, let's put that into context. And when I talked earlier about the, the, the conversations I've had, and there's an interest by the American government and by leaders in the legislative to rebuild a relationship that has been hindered by a sequence of events, this is one of those events which has hindered the relationship. My hope is that it doesn't affect aid. My hope is that it doesn't, it doesn't create greater complications for our Salvadorians here in the United States. And I'm lobbying as hard as I can in my dialogue so that it doesn't. I'm asking them, for them to understand that we're coming with a different vision in terms of this special and historic relationship that we've had with the United States. Great. Thank you. Um, well, why don't we open it up? I only ask that you identify yourselves, and uh, please be very brief so we can get as many people as possible in the conversation. Why don't we start with our friend here? Just wait for the microphone, please, because we're webcasting this. My name is Astrid Gámez from Family Services Network. I have been working in the... Hispanic community for the last 20 years in Northern Virginia. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. Well, you, uh, thank you so much for every, that, uh, everything that you have shared with us. My concern with the Salvadorians working with the Salvadorians family in Northern Virginia is that 93% uh, of our families hasn't finished third grade in Salvador. And the other thing is that uh, most of the families, that the women that I work with, 83% of the Salvadorians have been raped or sexual abused before the age of 18. What is your agenda if you get elected as president of El Salvador? And if you are going to be changing or making any change in la Ley de Protección Integral de la Niñez y Adolescencia? We need your help. Uh, children don't vote. Um, I don't know. No, 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 that's a fantastic question. Um, you mentioned a statistic, 93% of family members of Salvadorians in Virginia, uh, their children in El Salvador don't get past third grade. The, the, the people who attend our group, in, in, um, we do that with uh, the county, the Fairfax County. The Fairfax County. Yeah, we have been working. Yeah, and that's the reality that we're seeing across most of rural El Salvador. I was with a young girl, Estefania, in a small community two weeks ago. She said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. So she took me to her house. We sat down in what would be a kitchen, but it was, it was just a table in the middle of a house with a dirt floor, una, una casa muy humilde. And she started crying because her family had made the difficult decision to pull her out of school public school, which supposedly has no cost. But for a family 
so poor, there is a cost. There's a cost of transportation, there's a cost for food, and there's the cost of not having her working, either at home, taking care of the household, or selling products on the street so that she could bring an income into the household. So with my wife, with Carmen, Aida, who's my vice presidential uh, nominee, um, who's an educator, we are completely committed to making vast reforms in terms of education. People need help. They need help to stay in school. We want to close to double the budget in terms of education, and that entails uh, scholarship programs, financial aid for those people who need it, so that we can get universal education from pre-K through high school. That's the only way this country is going to get ahead. I've studied all the successful cases of countries that have gone through crisis and have rebuilt themselves. And there's not one that didn't bet on education. And I know it's not popular, politically speaking. I know it doesn't give you results in the electorate in the short term. But I don't care. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this the way that I think is best. And if I win, well, thank God. So we're going to bet on that. And I me comprometí con ella. But I've already me comprometido with the entire Salvadorian population. Um, we've been seeking with UNICEF, with Jimmy Vasquez. I don't know if you've spoken with him. He's got a great model for early stage education. I really believe in that. We're looking at economic models to see how we can finance that. Um, it's not fair. It's not fair that the most vulnerable Salvadorians can't have access to that when it's scientifically proven that it's probably the best investment, public investment, a nation can make, investing in early stage education. And there's a program that's been developed, that's been designed, which I love, which we can implement. We just have to find fiscally how we can structure it. But you're going to have a president that believes in that. I'm a product of a good education. It's the best gift God gave me. You know, it's incredible. So you can count on that. And with women's issues, I'm also surrounded by great women who are fighting for that. Andrea, who's here, my wife. I, I would love to ask you for an applause for my wife, who I love. She's the one who gave me permission to do this. So I'm eternally grateful. And after that, and after that permission, she's been by my side. And it hasn't been easy for her. So I'm thankful, babe. I love you. Um, she's committed to work with women. Uh, los niveles de feminicidios, el tema de la violencia intrafamiliar. It's, it's something that for me is, is completely unacceptable. And they go back to immigration issues. And they go back to immigration issues. So Carmen Aida, another passionate, I'm going to say she's a feminist. Carmen Aida is a feminist. Um, we're going to fight for that. We're also going to fight in our government to give representation to women. 53% of our population is women. I don't see why we can't find close to half or half or more than half of our cabinet in great women. It needs to be diverse. It needs to be representative. That's how I see things. So you're going to have a champion of women's issues, not only in these two great women, but also in myself. Thank you. I promise you. Why don't we take a few, a few questions, if that's OK, Carlos? Is it a, a round of questions? We can do that if you can help me take notes. In, or, or I can or give me a pen, and I'll take notes. We have pens here, so. Okay. I don't want to forget any of them. OK. Yeah, why don't we go to you, sir? Yeah, here, no, here, uh, Bernardo. Just tell us who you are, and please be brief, and then. Yes. My name is Mario Velasquez, and I work with the Latin American Youth Center. Uh, I have a question for Carlos. Carlos, you and your vice presidential nominee, uh, Carmen Aida Lasso, have uh, questioned the findings of the Salvadorian, the UN uh, Truth Commission, and the Inter-American, you know, uh, Commission on Human Rights, and the Vatican findings that the founder of your party, Roberto Dawison ordered the murder of Archbishop Romero. He will be elevated uh, on October 14th uh, to be a saint by the Vatican. So I would like to ask you, 
what is your evidence in full detail for you to question those three findings and for your vice presidential candidate in the last you know, interview she did with Focus to say that uh, there are no conclusive evidence or that these uh, three reports are uh, suspect? That's a fantastic question. Let's go to this gentleman here. Yes, please. Yeah, now. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for having Don Carlos here. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear when you, when Arena, you, you as a representative of Arena, was coming to to talk before our the, the United States What's your name people in the community. My name is Lindolfo Carballo. Okay. I I'm actually I was born and raised in El Salvador, and. Um, <clears throat> Before, right before asking your question, I would like to make a little, very small statement. Very, very briefly. Brief, briefly. Because we have to. I, I, was, I went to the University of El Salvador, the National University, in the 80s, and I was a student activist. And uh, we were fighting, this is during Arena's presidency. Uh, we were fighting to, for free uh, education to keep our university open. Yet the government was cutting the budget of the university. Therefore, we had to go to the street and fight, as anybody does it here in the United States. Yet, uh, we were being arrested for two days as students. More than 300 students were arrested during uh, Christianity's presidency. And then, a year later, I was kidnapped for three days. Torture, they put a plastic bag in my, in my head, uh, Karesen here in, in the United States was contacted to help me. My family mobilized around to figure out where I was. They went to the police, national police. They even wrote to, to, to Cristiani, to President Cristiani. And he was trying not to know anything about it. We even, they even went to Spain looking, seeking for help. Um, three days, naked, no eating, being thrown water on me. And, uh, and I've been harmed. That's why I came here. And I believe, and I bet you, that millions of people from El Salvador have come because of that. For repression, right? Oppression, and no access to health, education, and all that. Now, I'm asking you, will you be willing, in the name of Arena, to ask for forgiveness for what you did to me? And I hope, and I know, I'm sure, I will be willing to say there are thousands of people in the United States who also were tortured by the Arena government. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so gentlemen. Yeah, you want to answer? answer I just rather it? answer these two questions and then we keep going. Okay. Just okay. Here. First, Mario, fantastic question. It gives me an opportunity to clarify a situation. I'm a man of much faith. I'm a Catholic, and I celebrate enormously that we are going to have a saint. I'm a fan of Monsignor Romero. I've read him. My political policy, a lot of it's based on his inclusive vision. We have a picture of him in our bedroom. Y me encomendé a Dios y la Virgen y a Monsignor Romero en este proyecto político. 100%. 100%. And as a Catholic, I am in a hundred percent, and please put this on record, everyone, a hundred percent agreement with the Catholic Church that Monsignor Romero's case should be studied and we should get to the truth. I believe in the truth. I've met with priests from La Uca, from the Arzobispado, and we all agree. We all agree I agree with them. The documents which you name what they do is they señalar indicios. The word is indicios. Mi amado es que lleguemos a la verdad. That we get to the truth and not a political truth. Because it's, it's funny, this always comes out during elections. You know, I think I was four years old when that happened. Um, the 14th of October, my wife and I and my family, we're going to be celebrating that we're going to have a saint. And I really hope that for the first time in a long time, we can use his figure to unite and to not divide. Because it's been very painful for us Catholics to see his figure used politically to divide a nation that needs unity. 
And I know if he was alive, that's what he would want. Because his friends, who I am friends with, tell me that. The priests, and as a Catholic who I talk to, tell me that. So you can count on someone who will search for the truth, who will applaud the search for the truth, but not a political agenda to search, a real search for the truth. So we're allies in that, 100%. Hay indicios. Let's get to the truth. I think it would be great. It would be great. It could end a chapter where we've used an incredible man to divide us as opposed to unite us. And what better moment than now? Definitely. The reason I, the reason uh, I asked you that question, and as a Catholic, like you, and as a young man, younger than you, I was friends with Abish Romero. Yeah. And the reason I asked you that question, because when I heard you on a tape, and I heard Carmen Aida Lasso on, on that Focus interview, I was shocked. Because you can, this, this, this is not your responsibility or her responsibility. This is the, you know, the people that founded your party's responsibility. It's not yours. And there is no reason to deny that this ever happened or that Roberto Davison was involved. And what shocked me, was that as a young man with a vision, and I am very impressed with your eloquence and who you are. I'm impressed with your business accomplishments. I met once with you in El Salvador. I was very impressed by you. I met your father at the Club Campestre. We're going to have to... Great family. Okay. Well, I'm but I was shocked. We want to The move fact on, that you it? denied, the fact that these I never exhaustive denied. studies have concluded... Let's be clear. I've never let, denied... Let Carlos respond, please. I've never, you, I've never denied it. I've said... Son indicios, which is the words that the church recommended me to say because I've spoken with my priests. You want to unite the people of El Salvador? We, we, why, don't we, why don't we leave I, it there? I, I accept, we don't have time. I accept to that we should find the truth, which is what our cardinal said last week. Do you agree with that? Yes. Excellent. I'm glad we're in agreement. Okay. That's okay. awesome. I'll take the other question. Now, your question. I am sorry for what you went through. On behalf of the Arena. I am sorry... I'm not the one who should speak about whether it be Arena or anything. I'm sorry for what you went through. I'm not a spokesman for Arena. But I am sorry for what you went through, and I'm sorry for what all Salvadorians went through in that conflict. I don't care if you're sorry. Sorry. You you ask me for forgiveness on the name of the party that you represent. That's all I ask you. Would you be willing to do that? I'm willing. I can't talk for the party. I can talk for myself as a human being to another human being. Right, but you're, no, you're representing I Arena. think he asked, he answered your question. You're representing sir, sir, he answered your question. No, no, he's not answering. No, he's, he's answering, answering it. Sorry. You may not I like the answer. Many people are sorry. You may not like the answer, but he's answering they're it. They're dropping bombs in my, in my yeah. country. Okay. Yeah. They're then after that, I'm sorry. He's What's answered. Bullshit. He's, no. Okay. No, 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 no. Thank you can't be sorry. Okay, you made your point. Yes, Thank you. No, no, no. Yes. Would you be willing to forgiveness? He, you made your point. No. Yes, you did. But he's not responding to it. Well, us. he's responding the way that he thinks is right. I'm responding Let's on go. behalf of myself. No, Let's. No, 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 because you didn't do it. It was your party, the party that you were representing. Sir, we're going to have to go on to other people. It's not fair. Right. There are people that want to ask questions, no, too. The they have other stories, too. They have other okay. issues, and we'll have to go on to them. The gentleman in the back, please. Thank you. Um, my name is John Zan uh, with CTI TV of Taiwan. Um, so I have a question to, uh, actually it's a follow-up on the uh, China decision. Um, I know it's probably unfair to ask you whether or not you would um, um, redo the decision. But given the U.S. concerns, given the friendship that Taiwan has enjoyed with El Salvador for like uh, 75 plus years, um, would you at least reconsider, uh, you know, the decision and reconsider uh, uh, expanding some kind of uh, or keeping some kind of a relationship with Taiwan? And Taiwan was as surprised as you were to learn of the China decision, and they were disappointed. Would you say something to the people of Taiwan? Thank you so much. Um, excellent. Excellent question. Yes, I would say something the people of Taiwan. Um, I was surprised as they were. And to be honest with you, I don't think it was handled the way it should have been handled. Not only the lack of transparency, but also 
the lack of diplomacy in the way it was communicated to Taiwan. And I want to say on behalf of the Salvadorian people that they didn't deserve that. Now, with regards to establishing a relationship and cutting ties with China to go back with Taiwan, like you said, that's a speculative situation, and I cannot answer that. What I must say, and that's important for me to say, is that we have to nurture the relationship that we do have with Taiwan, commercially speaking, the friendship that we have with Taiwan. In no way can we permit, as Salvadorians, a rupture with Taiwan, commercially speaking, and in the friendship. There's countries like the United States who have a diplomatic relationship with mainland China, but there's a lot of goods, products, and services coming in to the United States. And as president of El Salvador, I will make sure to protect those channels of trade, 100%. And it, I don't know if this is a, a, a TV channel which will be seen in Taiwan. It is? Well, to our friends in Taiwan, in the Salvadorian people, you have people who appreciate and are thankful for so many years of aid. You made a difference in the development of our country. And in me, you will have a president who will continue to look as you, at you as a good friend. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. We're approaching the end of our time. We're going to ask one question there, and then I have a final question for Carlos. Uh, yeah, Abel Nunez, I'm the executive director of the Central American Resource Center. I want to go back to sort of the TPS, but to a larger discussion of, of immigrants. Um, your initial response, from what I understood, was that your hope to resolve the TPS issue is that the, a foreign nation, being the U.S., resolves it for you. Uh, as, as, the, as, as a candidate for the leader of El Salvador, what specifically are you going to do for one reintegration of uh, Salvadorans that are being deported. Right now, over 500 Salvadorans go back to El Salvador. So what are the specific plans that your government would do to ensure that they get re reintegrated into it? And also, what are your specific plans to ensure that Salvadoran nationals are protected as they're moving through? Because migration, whether we want it to stop or not, that's a long-term project. But in, in the immediacy, what are the specific problems for protection as, as, they're, as they're crossing to different uh, uh, countries and the reintegration programs, particularly those from TPS that, although you, you said that you're confident that something would happen, and if it doesn't, what is it that your government is prepared to do? Any solution will probably not be a 100% solution. So we have to prepare our country to receive a certain amount of people. There may be people who want to come back as well, seeing the opportunity. There are a time in their lives where they decided, okay, we want to go back, we want to start a business in El Salvador. So we have to create what we haven't been able to create over the last 15 years with the governments that we had, a country that is able to attract those Salvadorians who up to now have not wanted to come back. And when I speak to them here, and those who are questioning whether going back or not, or whether if there isn't a solution going underground here, in El Salvador, in the United States, what they want is opportunities. They want jobs. So we are currently working with the private sector nationally. I come from the private sector to create a red, una red of support so that we can receive these people and bring them into the workforce. The other big bet that I have is new entrepreneurs. Many of these Salvadorians are entrepreneurs. They want an opportunity to be entrepreneurs in El Salvador. The problem is the barriers to entry to be an entrepreneur, the nive nivel de tramitología, the bureaucracy, the red tape, it's ridiculous. Here in the United States, you can start a company in one day. There it takes months. So we need to create a situation so that investors, people who come from El Salvador and want to start, whether it be a shop, a restaurant, a hotel, get involved in the tourism industry, or want to find a job, has a channel to come in. Now, there's a psychological issue as well. I've studied a lot. So we need to give them the support they need to deal with this trauma as well. And that is a state responsibility. Como Estado. And I'm focused on that as well. And that starts now. Now, where we fail them from what they tell me, 
in this government, in the past government, is that we haven't held their hand through the process that they're going through now. They feel alone. They feel vulnerable. They feel injured. And they don't feel they have anyone who can be there for them. So we're focused on that. One of the first things we're going to do when we assume the presidency in the middle of the next year is work to that. By then it's going to be mid-year and the, and the date is September 19th. So a lot of that responsibility falls on this government. My call to action has been since a few months back so that our current government gets the ball rolling and starts moving on that. But we need to build a country, like I said, that can receive these people and give them an opportunity to get employed in a good job. And by that, we need to work and articulate the forces of the entire nation behind that. Private sector, public sector, together. And we're already working on a plan to do that. So I want to be clear. My strategy isn't doing a deal with the United States. That's what Salvadorians have asked me to do. And it's my responsibility as candidate and future president to try to represent Salvadorians here in their interest to stay here. And I'm going to work to that. But I've never kept my hands crossed. I've always been prepared. Plan A, plan B, plan C. And there will be people coming back. And my bet, regardless of the TPS thing as well, is that we need to build a country where Salvadorians can go back to and be happy living there. A lot of them here maybe won't want to go back. But maybe they want to go back with their families on vacation with their grandchildren. And they don't feel comfortable doing it because they're scared. And it's not maybe I know that they feel that way because I've spoken to thousands of them here in the United States. Thousands of them. So we have to work to build a better El Salvador. And El Salvador que cumple con los derechos constitucionales de nuestra gente. Y hoy por hoy no cumplimos ni con el primer artículo de la Constitución. Y humanos, 100%. Y empezar a unirnos. Y construir juntos. Y no señalarnos. Y no tratar de romper más una sociedad que ha sufrido mucho. Yo igual que vos, me vine aquí por la guerra, por amenazas a mi vida. Tenía tres años. Did I deserve to be threatened for my life? But I went back. I'm not saying everyone has had that opportunity. One of my greatest blessings was to go back. And I love that country. And I want my kids to have an opportunity. We all have scars. We were all impacted. But we have to unite. And I'm happy to talk to you. And like I said, I'm sorry for what you went through. And I'm happy we could talk about it. That's what we need to do. We need to communicate. And my job as president isn't to be president of ARENA. It's not president. It's not to be president of the Alliance. It's to be president of all Salvadorians. And that's why I got into this. My time outside of El Salvador gave me a different perspective. We've spoken about this. You know, we shouldn't throw more wood on the fire and bring up the flames. It's time to unite a country that has enormous potential. The lack of national accords is because we don't have the political will and oftentimes the maturity to try to build a country together. And we need to do that. And that is my bet. That is what I'm going after. Carlos, uh, thank you for that. Could I, I, we're ending the end of our time, but I would like to, if you don't mind, just ask you one final question. Uh, uh, a little bit building on, on what you've been saying. Uh, you, you, this is your first sort of enter into politics, but you've, you know, you followed politics for many years. I was bitten your by country, the bug. In your country and in other countries in the region, in the United States and elsewhere. Can you tell us, is there a leader, a political leader, that you admire, uh, that you look at as kind of a possible model for the kinds of things that you want to pursue in your country. I, I, I noticed that in your opening remarks, you used the word audacious a lot. We had a recent president who liked to talk about audacity of hope. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering if there's somebody 
out there, either in your party, your country, elsewhere, that you think, well, this is this is this person did it. This is what I would like to do. That you would look to as perhaps uh, some inspiration for what you would like to do as president of El Salvador. Um, I must say, I admire enormously Nelson Mandela. Uh, he's an incredible leader who suffered a lot and never gave up on his country, and, and, and he continued to battle to the end of his life. And I'm not saying El Salvador is going through the apartheid that South Africa went through, but I'm saying that our country needs to unite. I really believe that. And if I can be a force that helps that, one person alone can't do anything, but that helps ignite a flame and a contagion where we all decide collectively to look to each other as brothers, this country can get ahead. I really believe it. Listen, we went through a conflict which was brutal. It has left scars on both sides. It's broken down trust. We have to rebuild that trust. And I'm grateful to God that I had the opportunity to get out of there for a few years and get a different perspective so that I don't fall in any of the traditional frameworks of one side or the other of that conflict. I worked with the FMLN governments from the private sector on their agenda. I've been on their tables. You know, education, investment, uh, environmental issues, Alianza por la Prosperidad, for Milenio. We've had, my family, we've all been a part of this. We've never given up on this country, you know? That's why Monsignor Romero is an important issue for me. He should become a figure of uniting. And I wanted to clarify that. I'm sorry if you got the wrong interpretation from, from a, 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 something that, that in, someone in the media may have put out or, or a response of mine. I'm very clear as to that. I will be celebrating the 14th of October in sainthood. And I will look to him and to his writings uh, as a sense of inspiration for the jobs that we have to do. But there's one thing we should be very clear on. We shouldn't politicize him. He belongs to the church, to the Catholics, and to the Salvadorians. And we should let him be there. So you're not going to see me with a big poster of Monsignor Romero behind me in any campaign events. I'll promise you that. Um, Carlos, uh, I want to, on behalf of the uh, Alliance Americas and Asco Chacon uh, and the Inter-American Dialogue, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming here this morning and sharing your thoughts with us. We wish you good luck on the campaign trail. There are four months left, I guess, until the first round, a little over four months. So uh, It's going to go by like this. Right. But uh, all the best to you, and hope you'll come back and continue. we'll continue the conversation. So thank you, thank you very much for this. <laughs>